Well, Bing, you've always exemplified this smooth, easy-going kind of fellow, but we hear tell that as a youngster you were just a little bit more rambunctious than that. Oh, uh, I don't know where you got your information, Tony, but I guess I was pretty active. Uh, Irish-American parentage and uh, generally the, that breed of people are uh, pretty active, pretty uh, truculent, and I was into everything as a youngster, athletics and... Uh, little trouble down then, too, you know, a little light uh, skullduggery here and there. Nothing too serious. <laughs> this was in the state of Washington. Spokane, yes. Spokane. Born in Tacoma, but uh, moved to Spokane when I was uh, about two. I wonder if all that uh, dampness in the air up there gave the mellowness to the voice. Oh, not uh, it's not damp in Spokane. Uh, Tacoma, of course, is. That's on the coast. But Spokane... Uh, it has a very bland climate. It's uh, pretty cold in the winter and pretty warm in the summer, but it's dry, and it's about uh, 2,500, 3,000 feet altitude. Uh, I'd compare it so, so to Calgary uh, in your country, maybe not uh, quite as cold in the winter. We know he was the father of four boys, but uh, you came from uh, quite I a lot. I, I, I beg your pardon. And one girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, all the billing in here, Tony. <laughs> Don't short me a couple. <laughs> Uh, but you yourself came from a quite large family. Seven children, yes. My mother had seven children. There were uh, five boys and two girls. But this uh, hereditary, eh? I guess so. Now, uh, we've got five. I've had five boys and one girl, so I guess uh, the next will have to be uh, Mon Jolie Fille. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever perform as a, as a youngster? Did you ever sing around? All the time, yes. From the time I was... Uh, 10, 12 years old, I guess. My father played guitar, and and uh, we had a lot of singing around the house, and he had one of the first, uh, those days they called them gramophones. That was the old Victor machine with the the horn, you know, shaped like a, a tulip. What would you call that shape horn? A big mushroom? Yeah. <laughs> but we had one of the first uh, um, Victrolas or gramophones in town. We had all the records of the, the Peerless Quartet and Oscar Siegel and... Uh, Cohen on the telephone and the Suze's marches and the, the Victor Herbert uh, melodies and the singers and uh, Robin Hood and uh, De Colvin and uh, Gilbert and Sullivan and so there was always music in the house and I sang early and uh, participated in the religious uh, social functions singing little songs and uh, then when I got up into high school I sang a little more and uh, with quartets and finally we got a little band uh, my first year in college, and I sang with that band and played the drums. What and college was that? Gonzaga University, that's in Spokane, Jesuit College. And then I uh, I sang at the local theater there the f oh, my uh, third and fourth year of college, uh, doing the presentations, uh, film theater. We'd have a little prologue before the film, something uh, that had something to do with the background of the picture. If it was a sea picture, we'd sing a couple of sea songs, or if it was Western, we'd do some Western songs. Uh, and I worked there six or eight months. I was singing uh, pretty steadily from the time I was 10 or 12 years old, I think, Tony. That singing in the theaters between pictures, this was the early 20s? That would be uh, 19, 19 through 23, around in there. 20, no, that'd be 20 to 25, let's say. I'm trying to keep myself as young as I can. <laughs> but I think that's pretty accurate, Tony. About 20... 21 to 24 and 5, because I left uh, Spokane for Hollywood uh, late 25. Do you recall the first time you ever got paid for singing? Let me see now. I believe it was when I had uh, when I first got in this little band. Uh, that was my first professional engagement. We uh, we got three or four dollars a night for uh, four or five hours of uh, dance music and songs, playing uh, at uh, college functions and little uh, community. Uh, dues, soirees, and then we got a rather steady job one summer out at, at a lake, out at Newman Lake. Played there two two nights a week, Friday and Saturday, and we got something like uh, 15 or 20 dollars for the two nights. And then, of course, when I went into the theater, I got a little more than that, I think. I was getting about 50 dollars a week. But, that, of course, that was uh, two or three shows a day. Did you ever do any studying of singing, or is yours of the empiric school? Oh, no, no, empiric. At one time, uh, my mother sent me to a teacher. Uh, Professor Kranz was his name. Uh, I think I went to him for a couple of lessons, and he gave me a couple of songs. Uh, one of them was uh, One Fleeting Hour. 
and the other was uh, Perfect Day, and he taught me those songs. I was then about uh, 15, I guess, or 16. I imagine I went to him maybe half a dozen times. He tried to teach me something about breathing, but uh, I didn't absorb it very proficiently. I wished I had. It makes singing a lot easier if you breathe properly, but I don't. Not even now? No, I don't, I don't breathe properly according to the accepted theory of uh, breath control when you're singing, uh, the way trained singers sing. I just sing, and uh, lots of times you run out of breath when you wish you had a little, you know, when you're trying to uh, sustain a phrase or sustain a note, and uh, there ain't any air there. You haven't done too badly as a singer, you know. Well, I don't know. I've been very lucky. I think it's just because I sing about like everybody sings around the house, the bath bathroom singers. I sing like... Uh, or anybody, the fellow down the block, and the, they, uh, there's a market for that kind of singing because they feel it isn't uh, easy. It's easy and it isn't uh, affected, and uh, they hear a song sung in that way, in that fashion, and they accept it, particularly a popular song. When did uh, crooning come into being? Who was the first crooner? Was it Rudy Valley? Was it Columbo? Who was I, it? I guess Valley was the first uh, one to really be popularly called a crooner, generally called a crooner, although Gene Austin preceded him and uh, uh, Cliff Edwards before him, too. They both sang uh, very soft and cro did what, what became later known as crooning. Gene Austin was a very big singer uh, several years before Valley and had some very big records. And he certainly sang uh, very sotto voce. At that time, it was kind of a new school of singing. Yeah. But, uh, of course, the, the recording made it possible and, and made it popular because the fellow could get right up in the mic and sing soft and the recording machine could uh, pick it up. Uh, that's when they developed the new systems of recording uh, in the mid-twenties. Prior to that, uh, the old-fashioned recording, a fellow had to stand back and really belt uh, before they could pick it up and, and reproduce it on wax. And before that, it was on cylinders, which was even tougher. That's the first machine we had at home, was the old gramophone with the cylinders. And, and those fellows, uh, they tell me, used to really have to have some voice to register a crooner. As we know it nowadays, they wouldn't be able to make an impression on that cylinder, I don't think. As the quality of recording has improved, Ooh, so the yeah. quality of singing, popular singing, seems to have gone down. <laughs> That's right, when you, <laughs> when you consider it in terms of training and uh, the proper method of singing, the bell canto and the voice placement and get it up in the mask and the breath control, uh, you should breathe with your stomach and not your lungs, according to the way they train. I think that's proper. I'll be criticized for this, I imagine. And uh, as you uh, sing, the breath comes out and brings the tone with it. It makes it easier. That's why trained singers can sustain notes for a long time. They can sing long passages without reaching for any more oxygen, like we have to do. Getting back to the progress of the career, was it not the association with Paul Whiteman which got you into the big time? Surely it was, yes, and the association with the men that worked for Whiteman, uh, the great musicians, the great arrangers that were with Whiteman when we joined him, uh, that probably had uh, more to do with my advancement of, of uh, my career than any other factor. Of course, uh, before Whiteman, we played an awful lot of vaudeville, uh, but we were doing then just... Uh, jokes and little songs and gags and sketches and uh, as a singer I'm sure that uh, the uh, time I spent with Whiteman was uh, the most important part of my career because we worked with great arrangers like Roy Bargy and Ferdy Grofay and Matty Malnick and uh, Bill Chalice and uh, William Grant Still and uh, these fellas wrote vocals uh, and vocal accompaniments and uh, choral things for me to do and me to do with the rhythm boys and me to do with the other singers with the Whiteman group and uh, I learned a lot about singing and about harmony and uh, it was really a tremendous uh, benefit to me. How about the rhythm boys, Al Rinker and Harry Barris? Well, when did the, the group start? Well, that was, uh, Tony, that was in uh, 1928 uh, or 9 when we were with Whiteman. Rinker and I had been with him a year or two then and uh, we were in New York, and we weren't doing too well as a duet. We had done well on the road, but we came to New York, and uh, we laid sort of a souffle at the New York Paramount, and he took us out of the act, and uh, Barris was working the George Olson Club in New York at the time as a single, and Whiteman heard him, and he conceived the idea of putting uh, Barris with us and forming a trio, and uh, Barris had a couple of songs which he taught us, and uh, Rinker helped with the arrangements. Rinker was a pretty good musician, and uh, we um, worked up a little repertoire, and uh, made some records, and uh, they became popular, and Whiteman put us back in the act as a trio, and we were a success again. 
And after six or eight months with Whiteman, the, uh, the Keith Alvey time wanted to put us out in vaudeville as a trio without the band. And so we did that for about, oh, I guess seven or eight months, toured all over the country, all over the eastern part of the country at least. You've spoken about some of the people who influenced your style of singing. How about Al Rinker's sister, Mildred Bailey? Well, she had a tremendous influence. Uh, when we first came to Hollywood in 1925, Mildred was singing here in Los Angeles, had been for a couple of years, and uh, she knew some influential people here, people like Fanchon and Marco and cafe operators, and we lived with her. We had no other place to go. We were broke, uh, Al and I, and she had a nice home, and uh, so we lived there, and there was always music going on, and she was always singing, and uh, I'm sure that I uh, unconsciously uh, adopted some of her mannerisms, some of her... Uh, phrasing and some of her vocal tricks and uh, I used to listen to her enough around her house and we used to go out where she was working and uh, she had a lot of clever people around her people like Ray Mayer I don't know if you remember him not used to do an act called the cowboy and the lady and Art Varian and oh I don't Charlie Cayley and some of those old-time guys were around singing then and through Millard and through her associates and through the association with those people, I'm sure I've picked up a, a great deal of pointers and a great deal of hints and ideas about how to phrase and how to sing. I guess, though, uh, the fellow who affected my singing the most was probably Jolson, because way back when I was in school, I had all these records and I played them all the time. In fact, when Jolson went through Spokane and I was in college, I worked backstage at the Auditorium Theater as a property boy, helping back there for a couple of bucks, and... Uh, just got a chance to meet him and hear him sing, and he was doing a bombo at the time. And then later he came through uh, with Sinbad, and I also propped that show and heard him sing an awful lot. Wasn't it in Sinbad that he sang Swanee? That's right. Gershwin. Yeah, I sang it later, made a couple of records of it, sang a lot of it, yeah. Bing, by the time you got into motion pictures, you'd been on the road more or less 10, 12 years? Not quite that much. Uh, maybe six or seven years it'd be closer... Uh, the first time I really got in motion pictures, uh, in a feature picture, in a feature role, was the big broadcast of 1931, so that figures about six, seven years. Yeah. I've heard you say on another occasion that the first record you ever cut was, uh, in 1926, Muddy Water, correct? No, the first record I ever cut was with uh, Al Rinker and myself, uh, and made it with a band called Don Clark and his orchestra. They were then playing at the Biltmore Hotel here in Los Angeles, and we made the record in a warehouse downtown Los Angeles, I believe for Columbia, and it was a record called I've Got the Girl. And I have a copy of it someplace. It's quite, uh, quite interesting. We sound like, uh, uh, who's this guy does the chipmunks now? Uh, on the, makes the record? David somebody. Yeah, it? well, you know the chipmunk. Yeah. Or you know what I mean. That's, who, that's, that that's who we sound like. That isn't bad. They're pretty cute. We weren't cute, but we sound like them. Well, how did this um, picture business come about? Through radio... Into That's right. this one broadcast picture? Yeah, when I was in the... Uh, after I left Whiteman, I went in the Coconut Grove, and uh, I made uh, six shorts for Max Sennett, and a couple shorts for Christie Brothers, and another short for a guy named Gilstrom. These were uh, little musicals, two reelers. And then uh, Bill Paley sent for me. He'd heard some recordings, and uh, I went to New York and went on the Columbia Broadcasting System on a sustaining basis for... Uh, a few weeks or a few months, and then uh, as spo on a sponsored show, Cremo Cigars, and then from there into Chesterfield, and I forget all the other sponsors, but I was with CBS quite a while, and that led to uh, the big broadcast, uh, a picture that Paramount made, and they used uh, a lot of stars uh, from the radio of that, uh, that day, Kate Smith, the Basel sisters, the Mills brothers, uh, the street singer, uh, Morton Downey, myself, uh, to name a few. As radio in the early 30s was the big thing. Mm-hmm, big medium. Was it a lot of fun? It sure was. Uh, radio was great because you didn't have to wear any makeup or didn't have to rehearse too much. You no cameras. You just uh, went in there and was a short rehearsal with the band and they took off. You preferred that medium. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our radio's still here. You know, I've got a little radio program uh, five times a week with Rosie Clooney and Buddy Cole on uh, CBS. Comes into Canada or not. What about the um, Hollywood in the early 30s when you got your start here? What kind of a place was it? Well, it was quite different. Uh, the big studio system was uh, there were very few independent pr productions in, if any. It was the star system, contract players. Everybody was under contract uh, from the bit players right on up to the stars. Every studio had a long roster of contract players, and they searched around for properties to fit the uh, people they had under contract. And now it's uh, independent uh, people uh, have properties, and now they look around for people uh, who fit the properties. In your... 
long years of experience in this business, which is preferable to you? The old days, the major studios ruled over by tycoons, or today with the indies? Oh, I think, uh, well, not touching on that facet of it, because uh, that doesn't really make much difference uh, to the actor. He has a better chance now to... Uh, to set up a, uh, something financially where he can retain some of the income on a capital gains or a participation basis or on a deferred payment basis. Uh, some of them have made some fabulous uh, amounts out of pictures, like Jimmy Stewart out of the Miller story and Bill Holden out of the River Kwai by participation in the profits. Uh, but uh, it's really a lot easier working in pictures uh, now than it is then because of improved techniques and improved uh, equipment. For instance, when sound uh, first came in, it was really a job uh, getting a song done on the set because they didn't know uh, where to put the microphones to pick up everything, and they had an awful time photographing a scene and, and uh, also kept capturing uh, the dialogue without getting the microphone in the picture. And, and now with the sensitive microphones and the better recording techniques, all that is uh, done away with. And, uh, of course, the film is a lot faster now. You don't have to wear near the makeup you used to have to wear. Uh... The lights, uh, not near, nearly so many lights because of the much faster film. And that, uh, that makes it a lot easier on the actors because standing in those uh, real hot lights that they used to use for Technicolor was uh, very enervating. You find at the end of the day that uh, you're pretty pooped. And now with the, the lights cut down, it really isn't so tough. And they work a lot faster now than they used to. Uh, cameramen uh, work faster. Uh, technicians in all departments work faster. They're, they've learned... Uh, inevitably and how to do things quicker and more conveniently uh, they really shoot pictures now uh, when they want to i wonder if there's as much uh, glamour or romance attached to picture making as it used to be 30 years ago no i don't think so particularly with the stars uh, now the stars uh, some of the ladies for instance they roam around uh, in slacks and they've become uh, public figures one way or another the old days uh, uh, garbo and uh, dietrich and uh, some of the others uh, they were mystery women, and uh, they gave the public an opportunity to use their imagination to uh, put it together what they did know about them and with what the, they imagined, how they lived. And they were creatures of mystery, and uh, I imagine the glamour that uh, was thus uh, created was much greater than that that uh, stars have now. Now everybody's a regular guy. Probably it's nicer, I don't know. Uh, the girls are regular gals, and they have to go out and make an appearance as with the... Uh, with their new pictures, uh, cover the country to promote the box office, build it up, exploit the movie. All the stars have to do this. On a business basis. That's right. They probably got a piece of the picture and they'd like to see it succeed. And uh, if the studio asks them to go out and uh, help with this ex exploitation, why, they're glad to do so. Doesn't this kind of thing sort of break down the, uh, the illusion? Sure it does. Uh, you know, it establishes a closer contact uh, between the public and the star and... Uh, the illusion is lost by all means. Being the first time I recall seeing a picture of yours, I was very young, 1934, Mississippi with W.C. Fields. Oh, yes. Was John, that... John Bennett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Would that have been about the first of your big pictures? Oh, no. I had this big broadcast before that and a picture called College Humor before that, which was quite big. Uh, and several others. Those days used to make uh, two or three pictures a year. Now I don't do that. W.C. Fields has become a legend in this business, and I hear that he was sometimes difficult to work with. Never with me. Uh, we had a wonderful time. He, I knew him, of course, from the golf course and uh, lived uh, near him out uh, near Toluca Lake. He saw a great deal of him before we worked together. We got along fine. He, he used to get a little tired toward the end of the day, and when he did that, he, uh, he didn't want to shoot. Uh, so he'd uh, purposely uh, get into an argument about the script or something, something he didn't like, and let the argument drag on till. Uh, it got too late, and You're they'd have to cunning. dismiss the company. Yeah. He knew he wasn't at his best, and he just didn't want to shoot anymore. And so he'd uh, develop little uh, arguments about small points in the script or the way the scenes were going to be shot, shot so that he could drag it out till it was too late to shoot anymore, and then they'd have to dismiss the company. Bing, we have to talk about Bob Hope. Now, the first of the road pictures was uh, Singapore, 1939. I don't know about the date, but that was the first of the road pictures. Had you known Bob before that? Yes, we worked together... The Capitol Theater in 1932. He was on the bill with me, and uh, and I knew him uh, when he first came to Paramount. We played an awful lot of golf together, and uh, we lived uh, near one another in North Hollywood. And uh, I knew his wife before he knew her, uh, Dolores. Uh, she was in a show in New York called Honeymoon Lane, and I was taking out a girl in the show, and uh, we used to double date, Dolores and I. 
So we were, were old and fast friends even before we made the road pictures together. You would describe Bob as being a really a close friend, or is this just a professional bit? No, he's an intimate friend. He's uh, even uh, closer than a close friend. We have a great deal, uh, many things that uh, bind us together. Uh, in addition to our appearances, uh, our families are very close. I'm uh, a godfather to one of his children, and Dolores is godmother to one of mine, and... Uh, we spend a lot of time together. He's uh, awful busy. It's awful time. They're awful uh, difficult to get with him too much. He's either east picking up a plaque, or he's gone to South America, or he's in Alaska entertaining the troops. Uh, he's getting a lot of uh, well-merited awards uh, just now, particularly the one that the Academy gave him the other night, which I thought was a uh, long time in coming and overdue. He's getting so many awards. I see Dolores had to pick up one for him the other day. He couldn't even make it. He was east getting another one. And, so Dolores had to go down and get one. I believe it was from the Hollywood Press uh, Correspondence Association for being the most cooperative uh, guy in the business, which he certainly is. Well, Bing, you've always put up this front of being very sort of lazy and casual and this, that, and the other. And I know from talking to people that you work hard and you're sometimes very tense. Now, what about Bob? He has this carefree, glib attitude. What does he like underneath that? He, uh, when he works, he's very tense and he works very hard and he's very excited about what he's doing and very keen about it. But he has a, a faculty which I envy him uh, for. He can sit down in that chair over there and go to sleep for 30 minutes any time he wants. And uh, he works very late at night. Uh, most of his shows, most of his rehearsals are late at night. And if he doesn't have anything to do the next day, he'll sleep till 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He'll sleep the clock around this fellow, which is something that I wished I could do. I can get about seven or eight hours, then i got to get up. And as a result, it's six or seven o'clock in the morning, and then by uh, after dinner, I'm tired. But he's not because he slept all day, or he can get these little cat naps. I've seen him get on a plane, and uh, before they've even uh, taxied down the runway, he's corked off. He's sound asleep, and uh, that's how he's able to do the work he's able to do, I imagine. But he really wouldn't be happy if he wasn't working. Uh, I recall some years ago, he had a a uh, little uh, interlude between movies when he didn't have anything to do and we were talking he said what the devil am I going to do I said I don't have to do any work for a couple of months I said why don't you take a nice long vacation take a trip he says trip I wouldn't know what to do unless there was a job he said oh take a trip to South America I got some friends down there take the lawyers and I'll write them tell them you're coming and you'll have a good time and so away he went and that's Bob well, he, on the go he, he came back uh, about uh, seven or eight weeks later he had the hives, the shingles, and a spastic colon. And he said, you dirty rat, you. He said, talking me into that vacation, that's the last one I'll ever take. And to my knowledge, it is the last real extended vacation he's ever taken. It appears that when he got down there and had all that time on his hands, he just got in a stew, you know, and he got ill. Now, you're not like that. You no, prefer not to work. No, I get ill when I work. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got the shingles or the hives or a spastic colon, but I get very tired. Bing, we keep hearing all kinds of rumors we have for so long about you getting out of the business. What's the truth here? No, I don't suppose I ever will, Tony, get entirely out of it. It's uh, it's my life, and uh, it, it's uh, good to have an interest in something, and this is my only interest, uh, really a serious interest, is show business. And I have quite an organization, staff, the office, and uh, I have a library uh, recording staff down there, and we doing these uh, daily radio shows, as I told you, with Clooney, and uh, it really has built up into uh, something that I can't really uh, disperse all of a sudden like that, you know? Do you want to work less and less as time goes well, by? I am. I don't do much anymore, Tony. Uh, this is the first picture I've done uh, in just a year now, and uh, well, I, did, I did four television shows last year, exclusive of the uh, some sports broadcasts like... Uh, the golf show from Pebble Beach and the golf show in Vegas and uh, several others in Florida around like that. Those are nothing uh, really important or there's no work involved. So I don't do too much. I, I spent an awful lot of time away from Hollywood last year, uh, hunting and fishing. I was in Calgary for a hunting trip. I was up uh, to Prince Rupert to go there every summer for two or three weeks fishing. And I go dry fly fishing an awful lot in Northern California. And I've been to Mexico twice last year on fishing trips down to La Paz. Uh, so that'll give you an idea. I couldn't have done too much work and done all, done all those things. You're a going fishing type man. That's right. <laughs> Whenever I can. Bing, we've also heard you making some rather disparaging remarks about the quality of your voice these past few years. Oh, it's not as good as it used to be. It doesn't sound like it to me, and uh, I can tell. I don't have the range I used to have. I don't know what to uh, attribute it to. Just uh, 
the pipes are, are not as resilient. They're not, they're, they don't respond like they uh, formerly did. Is it also that you have less interest in singing? I don't sing enough. That's probably the uh, major factor, Tony. You, you know, I used to sing all the time when I was I had a weekly radio program, an hour show, for all those years, and the pictures and the recordings and the nightclubs and the cafes and the theaters. Uh, now I, I can recall, like, for instance, this year there was a period I didn't sing a note between, uh, oh, maybe uh, May and uh, 1st of November. And that's bad for a singer, particularly a popular singer. I flirt with the idea occasionally of getting a little group and playing a nightclub someplace, but uh, then I think of the work it involves, and uh, I eschew the idea quickly. Well, on behalf of all the old Crosby fans, <laughs> you mustn't give it up. I don't suppose I ever will, no. I'll be doing something. Some kind of work. Bing, it's been very nice talking to you. Thank you, Tony, and uh, I want to take the opportunity and the advantage here uh, of using your facilities to uh, say hello to the friends of mine in Canada... They've been awful nice to me in Canada on the many trips I've made there. Fishing and hunting and golf tournaments and once in a while doing a little work, but not much. It's always been fun in Canada. And uh, the reason for it is that the people up there are uh, so kind and so pleasant and so agreeable and so appreciative of uh, what we want to do when we go there. I love you're, them. You're welcome anytime. Thank you.